Yo, welcome to the home for anime. I am your host, GPC, great podcaster Callie, also known as Cameron. And of course, there's a reason that I would introduce myself in both ways, because this is a very special episode of the home for anime. This right here happens to be not just an episode for volume four, a celebration of Kyoto Animation, but also a homie check-in. But I think that the first part should be explored before the second, because this is actually part two of the person series that I am covering with my good friend Ryan. Ryan, what's good? Hey, what's up, man? Good to be back. Yeah, so this week we watched the Kyoto Animation film Liz and the Bluebird, and oh my god. Oh man. That was one of the most beautiful films I have ever seen in my entire life. It's a good, good watch. I mean, must see. Must, a must see. <gasps> it had just, it seemed like it had two different art styles, or at least it used two different types of colors. Mm hmm. So the two art styles, you would have the, I guess what you would call the real world, quote unquote. Yes. Where it was pretty much like normal, I guess, anime, like your standard animation. Kind of, then... but better. Right, right. The animation was very aesthetically pleasing. Yes. And then you had this storybook world that was kind of, the story was, was kind of told in parallel. Yeah. So... About Liz and the Bluebird, and it was yes. always watercolors and, and then a you slightly had, different artistic choice and then of course you had um nozomi and mizore who were the two main characters this is actually a spinoff of the anime sound euphonium which i think i've told you about before yes but i've never seen it <laughs> so actually sound euphonium is not one of my favorites no no, it's not. I don't know why. I guess it's because it's band, like orchestral music, and not uh, like how we covered Inuo, and that was really mm. rock centric. And right. then you have like the stuff from the '80s that's super poppy. This is very conventional. Not to say I don't like uh, orchestra orchestra music, but yeah, I don't know something about it and the drama that's involved just kind of turns me off. Doesn't but, really but strike for, as entertaining. But for some reason, this was incredible. Oh, and yeah. And I think it's because as a spinoff, you have the opportunity to explore other facets of the cast. Mm -hmm. Because this is just two, these are just two side characters. And Nozomi and Mizure, who Nozomi being the outgoing person between the two and Mizure being the dependent one on Nozomi. Mm -hmm. And it's just them getting this story, this Liz and the Bluebird story that they have to perform and them struggling to do it because their friendship is also struggling as they're moving on into adulthood. Right. And I think the, the fact that they started struggling and the music reflected that the way that music is used as a tool in, a, in the movie mm -hmm. is very interesting. It is. I mean, yes. you, you could say the same for, you know, and, and several other musical Lou over the wall and stuff like that. But this was a, a kind of solo or a duet section that they played together and it directly reflected how they felt on the inside without having to speak. Right. About how they felt, you know, with their relationship. That's pretty cool to see. Yeah, because you don't really see in many pieces of media not just the feeling on the inside, but also the feeling toward another because you're playing off of somebody else. Right. So seeing how they were feeling about themselves while also seeing how they were feeling about the other person because that is who they had to perform with. That was just so interesting. And the music choice of Liz and the Bluebird, I just think, really captured that perfectly. And 
there are two separate points where it is described as either a happy ending or a sad ending, Liz and the Bluebird, because Liz lets the Bluebird go at the end, even mm -hmm. though the Bluebird came to be with Liz. Mm -hmm. And there's very much that thing of, if you love something, set it free. Right, exactly. And I guess this is just where the whole dynamic of having a person comes in mm -hmm. because all this time when you're thinking through the movie, you're like, Oh, Nozomi and Mizore, they have this relationship that seems kind of one sided, unhealthy. Yeah. It seems like Mizore is very dependent on Nozomi. Mm -hmm. And it seems like she doesn't really have it together. But right. then you come to realize it may very well just be the opposite way. That whole, if I can't have you, then maybe no one should type thing on right. Nozomi's part. Yeah, I want you all to myself. And yeah. Not, I don't want you to have a stronger relationship with someone else other than, you know, other than me. Right. And that possession is just so mm. unhealthy. I mean, yeah, truly, that is that is where I suppose the homie checking should begin because we talked about the music, we talked about the anime. It is truly, truly a beautiful film. Naoko mm. Yamada, who directed a silent voice, was the one who helmed this film, and just she is incredible and. She deserves all the praise in the world. I'm so happy that she exists as a director. Yeah, fantastic. Yes, the anime industry is truly blessed to have her. And the the toxicity of the one-sided person relationship that we briefly touched on last week, it's very evident here that when you have that relationship that you want to preserve, but you just aren't mature enough or emotionally stable enough in some cases to be able to preserve it, there is this huge disconnect. Mm -hmm. And the only way that you can see yourself preserving it is by knocking the other person down, by keeping them away from everything and everyone. Right. Uh, social interactions with other people and mm -hmm. that, that possession or jealousy, however you want to put it, it can't, it can't last forever. It's not good for either party. It can't sustain a relationship. No, it's not. It's not healthy. And again, throughout this entire film, I'm thinking, oh, okay, misere is like she she's not stopping knows me from doing anything on the contrary she's like i i just want i just want to still be friends with her mm -hmm. but as soon as she gets some interaction some social interaction mm -hmm. it's it's a problem yeah and immediately it's it, it was a stressful watch honestly yeah it was it was but you know if, if someone out there finds himself in you know a relationship with with this kind of thing going on with uh <clears throat> not necessarily it being one side but a person who wants to preserve that relationship so badly that it is almost like unspoken rules and boundaries are put on the other. It, I think we talked about it a little bit before the show. I think there's kind of a few ways to handle it. I'm sure there's more than just these two, but either like taking a break and then getting back together to kind of try to work it out. Mm -hmm. You know, the person who feels like they might be 
um, held back a little bit mm-hmm. and come out to the other and say, you know, hey, I think we should talk about this and try to resolve this because this doesn't feel good, right? <laughs> you know, and and you know, hopefully try to resolve things and uh, that can be known moving forward and hopefully you know people change after a conversation like that if they truly do care about the other person, right? Or we talked about the alternative route. If there is no resolution, even after communicating about it, then maybe sometimes it's just best to let that person go. Right. Uh, Because, again, sometimes if you love someone, you've got to let them go. But and this is very important. This is very much in the in the realm of self-preservation. If you recognize these toxic behaviors from someone, especially someone who is supposed to be your person, which, I mean, in Misere's case, she's like, Nozomi, you are my everything. Right. And their relationship still turned out the way it did, which I we can't spoil, of course. Yeah. But um, it's just a matter of, doing it for yourself doing what's best for you yes if you love someone set them free but if you love yourself set yourself free yes well said i would agree you know this reminds me of this one per this one old friend of mine who i could definitely tell wanted me to be their dedicated person Mm -hmm. but for years all that would happen was they would tear me down any opportunity that they got and whenever i had someone new into my life Mm -hmm. they wanted to know everything about them wanted to be a part of everything me and that person did and Mm -hmm. eventually enough people came into my life who we're like, this isn't okay. Yeah, it's not right. That it it had to it had to stop. Yeah. And it yeah. was really hard, but Yeah, that can be extremely difficult. And and I'm I'm sure I think you're the same way. Like I don't like hurting people. I don't like hurting people's feelings. I so I yeah, I'm pretty bad at those types of conversations, like it's obviously easier said than done. But like I said, if it's best for you, dragging the relationship along just for the sake of not hurting someone can actually, I would say in some cases, hurt them worse in the long run. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it will hurt, right? If you do decide to end that relationship, friendship, you know, with somebody, but to just let it, go on and letting things like bottle up and then starting to resent one another, it, it only hurts more in the end rather than, you know, nipping in the bud and cutting it off where it probably should be. Right. Because you're right. Leaving is hard. Leaving is so mm-hmm. fucking hard. Yeah, it is. But staying Staying can be the worst injustice that you can not only do to the other person, but do to yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's essential to take care of yourself. Everyone who is listening to this and beyond deserves to have the healthiest of relationships. Mm -hmm. Because I had a lot of bad friendships before I started hanging out with Ryan. I mean... Mm -hmm. It might have seemed like all of last episode we were bragging about our friendship. Well, mainly me. I was doing most of the bragging. (laughs) But that was just to say it's a very healthy relationship and it has done a lot for both of us. But there there are friendships, there are relationships that are detrimental. And when you find yourself being the person who is being depended on as that person or if you find yourself leaning too much on someone someone's going to get hurt Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And the best possible thing is when you can recognize that. And I mean, Ryan, you said last week that at one point I was so worried about it that I asked you if I was doing too much. Yeah. And that transparency really helped us in the long run because yes. I was starting to resent myself for how I thought I might have been treating you. Right. That goes back to what you were saying. You know, someone will get hurt. And just to add on to that, I feel like nine times out of the 10, it's going to be both people. Right. It's, it stinks. <laughs> it's not fun. So it's good to work through. And I'm glad we, you know, communicated when we did. Yes. Cause things probably would not have gone well later on. Well, yeah. Left unsaid, it just would have been painful for the both of us for sure. Right. So Liz and the Bluebird truly is, and I do not say this lightly, a masterpiece. Yes. I think that it stands toe to toe, not in terms of themes, but in terms of direction, quality, and emotion with a silent voice. Oh yeah, I would agree. And Naoko Yamada's progression as a director is just so clear because she just puts out the most amazing work and the fact that films like these are so emotionally powerful and resonant with so many people Mm -hmm. i mean to talk about the power of music with something like again inuo or lou over the wall they have nothing truly on a film like Liz and the Bluebird and how music is interwoven into the story, not just the performance, but the aspect of playing music and the story that is being told through the music. Right. And in multiple ways. Yeah. It's awesome. That is so incredible. Yeah. Very creative way to use that as a tool to convey the emotions of the characters and and it definitely draws an emotional response out of the audience too. Absolutely. Because I mean, I was on the verge of tears several times. Yeah. So that was my, I was going to ask you, we didn't have our cameras on during the movie. Did you shed Uh, a tear or two? um, Yeah. Uh, I was close. I welled up. (laughs) I welled up, but uh, we were both bawling. Oh, multiple times. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> multiple times but with liz and the bluebird i i lost it at the end i mean there are multiple times where mm-hmm. i was just like uh mm, mm, yeah. hold it in hold it in <laughs> get back in there too but at the end i just i couldn't and i just mm-hmm. it was a lot yeah it is but it's such a great watch it is and I'm so happy to say that I have the Blu-ray and uh, Levin Arts really knows how to pick what it is they're going to distribute. So it so good. (laughs) Really? So it's, it's incredible. And another win for Kyoto animation. Another dub in the books, man. Yes, sir. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Ryan, do you have anything more to say about Liz and the Bluebird? I don't want to give too much away. Go and watch it. It's available. Well, we watched it on Amazon Prime Video for rent, which was just a couple bucks. But where else can you find it? You can get the Blu-ray from a lot of major retailers. And I think you Mm -hmm. can buy it on Apple TV for like $10. Okay. Okay. Oh, it's also available to watch for free with ads on Prime Video as well. That is correct. So that's a great option. Yes, that is great. We just didn't have the time for that. Yeah. We, we just <laughs> we added found, a bit of runtime. Yeah, we, we found a few bucks lying around and we're like, oh, well, all right, then. I've got some pennies and quarters over here. <laughs> <laughs> so overall, Liz and the Bluebird, truly, truly one of the greatest films I have ever seen. And Ryan and I have watched a lot of anime films together. Would you say this breaks into your top 10? Top 10 easily, yes. (laughs) Nice, me too. Yes. (laughs) It's just so, it's 
anytime Kyoto Animation comes out with a film, I'm like, okay, that's going in the top ten. That's going in the top ten. That's going in the top ten. And really? I'm not even done yet. <laughs> <laughs> it is an impressive studio. Yeah. Well, hopefully I can have you back on for more of their projects while I'm going through Volume 4. Maybe even a Sounds silent like voice, potentially. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see. Is, I don't know if I'm... I, I'll have to uh, get you know sit down and watch it with you on a day that I am ready to let some tears out. Yeah, because I think the last time we watched it was my birthday. Mm-hmm. Not about a two years ago. Yeah, and we have watched back. it. We have watched it multiple times, though. Yeah, I think two or three with us together. With us together, yes. And I think I've watched it alone two or three times. I've watched. I've no. I've watched it at least six times. It's such. Uh, I I could talk all day about that movie, but. Yes. I digress. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining me for yet another homie check-in, Ryan. Of course, and man. For this That's very fun. special episode of Volume 4. I, this is one of the ones that I'm, I went into super nervous, super fresh. I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but it's I just know I'm going to do it. And... Mm-hmm. It just, it just turned out to be a beautiful experience. So please watch Liz and the Bluebird, everybody. And hopefully what we said helped and you can find good friends. No, great friends, because that is what mm-hmm. you deserve. You deserve the best of friends and partners because you're amazing people. And deserve it. you deserve it. No one deserves to be treated badly. And with that being said, you have a wonderful day, night, morning, whenever you listen to this. And we are out. Peace.